Good morning. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's an honor to be here. But before we jump into the word, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Stephanie Spence. I am a mother and a wife. We have two little boys, uh, Jax and Bo. Jax is five and Bo is two. Aren't they cute? They're cute. All right, this is from a year ago, though. Um, because it's really, the struggle is real to get boys to take pictures. Um, so that's, that's the newest one I have. But I love them dearly. I love my husband. We have been married. This year will be 10 years in July. Thank you. Um, he's my safe space. He is everything I'm not. Him and God keep me on the right road, and sometimes that is hard. He's awesome. But sometimes we don't get along. Uh, sometimes we fight. Sometimes we fight on the way to church. <laughs> Can I get a witness? <laughs> Amen. Come on now. Sometimes we fight on the way to church. Actually, the first time we come to Mount Movers, we were in a fight. So we live in Jay, and it's about a 30-minute drive from our home to church. 25 minutes of that ride, we're not talking to each other. We have a kid in the back. We're trying to behave ourselves, but we're angry. You can feel it in the car. And then we get about five minutes to church. And I'm thinking to myself, if we don't have it in this car, how are we going to have it together in church? I do not want to be around him anymore. And I'm sure he don't want to be around me. And the next time I can turn around, I'm turning around. We're going home. We ain't making it to church. And I hear the Lord say, get to the parking lot. And I say, Lord, I want to hurt him. <laughs> and I'm sure he wants to hurt me. But by the grace of God, we get to church, we enter that parking lot, and it was a total different experience. They were happy, we were not. And I was like, maybe this can wrap up, maybe this will work, and it did. The whole experience was great. From the parking lot to the end of service, and we get back in the car, and we're going home. And I look at my husband, and I said, well, what do you think? What do you think? And I don't remember why we were in a fight, and neither does he. But I remember what he said. And he said, we will never go to another church again. I've never felt that way. We're home. Yes, thank you. And we've been coming to Mountain Movers now for almost three years. In those three years, we have grown so much by by learning from the congregation, by learning from Pastor Brad and Misty. And one thing that... Uh, they talked about was having a Rima word. And so what that is, a Rima word is just a personal word that you seek out from the Lord, from the Lord to you. And I want to share that word with you today. So my Rima word is, 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 if God can use a donkey, I'm the donkey. Yeah, not the, not, not the most profound maybe statement, but it has changed my life. It has changed the way I see myself it has changed the way I see how God sees me, but it's really changed my relationship with God. And so I want to share that with you today. And what better way to jump in the story about a donkey in Numbers 22. So I'm not going to read you the whole story. You can read it yourself. It's great. I'm going to jump right in the middle of it, but I want to give you some context, some characters who we have, the key role people. And the first thing you need to know, you have the Israelites. So the Israelites are in the wilderness, but they're on their way out. We're in year like 38. They're going to the promised land. They're taking names. They have your reputation. They are forced to be reckoned with. Okay, with me? And then we have King Balak. And so what has happened is the Israelites have set up near his territory, the Moabite territory, and he gets fearful of them. He gets afraid of what they might do to him in his territory. So he sends off for a guy named Balaam. And Balaam is a prophet. Now, Balaam is not a prophet of the Lord. He is a paid prophet. And we see from the story, we know this because when the officials come, they bring with them a fee of deviation. He's a diviner, meaning he's a seer of gods. He's a pagan. He's a witch. He's not Jewish. Okay. And then we have the donkey. And then we have God, God of Israel. So before we jump to the story, this is what's already happened. The officials have come to Balaam's house. They say, hey, we got these people. 
we got some money, come put a curse on them. And he's like, cool, stay the night here. Let me go see what the Lord says. And the Lord comes in swinging. So we're gonna start in verse nine. God come to Balaam and ask, who are these men with you? It's like when my dad says, who are you hanging out with when I was in high school? These people are not a good influence. This is a bad idea. Who are they? What's their intentions? And naively, Balaam just answers like, hey, this, they're not bad. They're okay. Uh, I'm just going to go over here, do a little curse, and I'm going to come back. No big deal. And God goes, okay, this guy's not getting it. Verse 12, but God said to Balaam, do not go with him. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Verse 13, the next morning, Balaam got up and said to Balak officials, go back to your own country for the Lord has refused to let me go. That sounds good. He did what he's supposed to do. He said, no, but did he? No, he said, the Lord refused to let me go. He didn't just say no. How often do we want to do what God doesn't want us to do? How often do we want a different answer for him? We don't like the answer that we got. The, I, mean, I want to go, but the, God said no. I still, but I still kind of want to go. See, what happens is we don't shut that door. We don't just say no. Balaam leaves that door open like many of us and allows the enemy, the enemy to come right back in. And that's what happens. In the next verse, the officials go back to the king and say, hey, your dude said he's not coming. He's refused. Um, he said the Lord won't let him, let him come. And the king goes, ah, he wants to come. Let me convince him. Our send back higher officials with more money. And you tell him, I'll give you whatever you want. Just come curse these Israelites. And so we see in verse 20, Balaam's response. That night, or I'm sorry, verse 18. But Balaam answered to them, even if Balak gave me all the silver and the gold in this palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. Verse 19. Now spend the night so I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. So it sounds great. He said, I can't do it. The Lord said, no, but let me go back and see if I can convince him. Let me see if I can get a different answer. Let me see if he'll change his mind. He's like my little five-year-old who will come into me and ask me the same question 10 times in 60 seconds. Can we go now, mom? Mom, 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 how about now? I got my shoes on. Can we go now? Now, I'm nice to my brother. I don't know why we can't go. Why can't we go? Let's go. And, and Balaam's the same way. He keeps asking over and over. And God's like, the answer is no. Why are you not getting it? In verse 20, God comes to him and he says, since these men have come to summon you, go with them. But do only what I tell you. Verse 21, Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey and went to the Moabite officials. Verse 22, but God was very angry that he went and he sent the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. That's confusing. God said, go. He went. Now he's angry. What's going on? And it reminds me of a story that my father loves to tell me because he loves to tell me how stubborn I was when I was a little girl. And my husband's thinking right now she still is. Um, but that's beside the point. When I was little, my dad was watching me. I was probably three or four, and we were outside, and he was grilling on the grill, and I was doing whatever, and I kept going to the grill and wanting to touch it. He's like, don't, don't touch that. I said, no. I go on and do my thing. I come back, and I, I try to touch the grill again. He's like, stop. Don't touch the grill. And he kept doing this over and over, and he got, finally he got tired of my game. And I went to go touch the grill again, and he looked at me, and he says, Touch the grill. Do it. Okay, I'm touching it. And I touch the grill. I scream, I cry. I'm sure my mother comes out and goes, what have you done? You're supposed to be watching her. She, she's crying. He's like, I let her touch the grill. And she's probably thinking, you're crazy. You're supposed to watch my child, my baby. And she probably picks me up and she's saying, what have your father done? But like a good father, my, my father 
earthly father knew what I needed. He didn't want me to continue to go back, but he understood that I had a stubborn will and that I wanted to touch that. And I was going to suffer the consequences. And just like our heavenly father, he understands sometimes we have to go through pain if we don't accept the answer first. And so that's what's happening here. Thank you. Um, in verse 23, 34, we see the donkey. The donkey comes in play. We have Balaam who gets on his donkey and the donkey can see the angel of the Lord with the sword. But the, God, the guy, the prophet, the seer of gods can't see him. How ironic. But the donkey can. And so he tries to steer him away over and over again. And he keeps getting mad at his donkey and he keeps beating him into submission. Finally, the Lord opens the donkey's mouth and the donkey's like, okay, if you're not reading the Bible this way, you should, because I picture Shrek and I picture Eddie Murphy voice coming out when the donkey's talking in the Bible. This doesn't happen anywhere else, right? The donkey's talking. And so I picture Eddie Murphy going, what are you doing to me? Why are you keep beating me? And so in the verses, they're having these conversations back and forth. And the donkey reasons with Balaam. And he's like, I've never done this to you. Like, why do you keep doing this? He's like, yeah, you're right, cool. And then God opens ba uh, Balaam's eyes and he sees the angel of the Lord standing in the sword, with the sword opposing him. And he falls to his face and he's like, I've sinned, I'm so sorry. And the angel of the Lord's like, you are on the wrong road. I'm here to oppose you. Here's another sign. Even though I've given you 700, but you still don't get it. Here's another one. And he says, I'm sorry. He says the right things. But then he says, can I still go? And the angel of the Lord goes, go, but do only what I tell you to do. Say what only I tell you to say. And so he goes, he goes to the territory and he doesn't curse the Israelites like the king asked him to. He blesses them three times and he does kind of what he's supposed to do. But you see, partial disobedience is still disobedience. He still disobeys. But what's cool about this, even though he's greedy, even though he disobeys, he's still used by God. God still uses him to bless the Israelites. God uses the donkey to get him there. And that's the first point of today's message. God can use, can use anyone or anything. He can use any situation. The situation he had in front of him was not ideal. You know, I think that one of the biggest lies the devil tries to convince me of is that I can't be used, that I'm not enough, I'm not qualified, I've done a lot of bad things, he can't use me. And instead of arguing with him, I say, yep, you're right. I am not enough, I am not qualified, and neither are you. And that's exactly why God will use me, because he will see, receive the glory, not me and not you. And so I think we have a society who pushes down our throats that we have to know the details of our purpose, that we have to be used in a certain way, that we get on Instagram or Facebook or whatever your vice is and you're like, well, look what these people are doing. I want to do that. That's how I need to be used. That's what I should be using. And we have this comparison spirit that sets in our heart that we have to make God in this box and he's not. We see from the story that God will use a pagan. God will use the situation. He will use a situation of a lost job. He will use a situation of that miscarriage. He will use a situ any situation. He will use it for good. And he will use anybody for good. If God can use a donkey, he can use you. So what's, what should we be searching for? What should we seek out? If we're, not, if we're not supposed to seek out that, that being used is inevitable, then what should we be looking for? What's the goal? And I think we can find it in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. On judgment day, 
Many say, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast demons out in your name and performed many miracles in your name. Then I will plainly tell them, I never knew you. I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me. Get away from me, you evildoers. That's harsh. And I thought, okay, God used the people in Matthew. He used them to do miracles. He used them to do cast out demons. He used them, but he didn't know them. So the goal was for me to know God. Got it. And I thought, oh, for him to also know me, because it says I never knew you. And I thought, well, that's weird, God. You created me. You created these people in Matthew 7, 21, 23. How do you not know them? What does that mean? And so I looked up the Greek word for new in this uh, verse, and it's egg known. And so what that means is to come to know. That makes sense. I need to come to know the Lord. But then it says, recognize, perceive. Recognize. He's saying, I don't recognize them. I knew them, but now I don't. I don't recognize them. And what came to my mind was the verse, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you, I knew you. And this new is different. This new is this impersonal relationship. This new is the things I have planned for you. What I've put you on this world for, your purposes. He's saying in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, we want to be recognized how he created us. That these people have gone so far from that that he doesn't know them anymore. And I think the goal is that when we meet our maker and we look at him eye to eye, he will go, yeah, that's my daughter. That's my son. That's how I created him. And that's the second point of today's message. The goal is to know God. So how do we know that we know God? First John 2, 3 says, this is how we know that we know him. We keep his commands. Another word for command is word. We keep his word. In the same chapter, different verse, it says, the one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. We are not to be like Balaam and the people in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We're not to have this outward appearance of being religious, but then have no relationship with God. Because when we have that outward religious appearance and we, don't talk, we talk the talk, but we don't walk the walk, that can be dangerous. And so if we want to have that relationship, that real life-changing relationship, we have to do the lily work. And if you were here last week, Pastor Misty talked about the lily work. And so what the lily work is, is they had built these uh, pillars that were three stories high. And at the top of the pillars to the temple, they put lilies on top of them. Well, no one's going to see those. No man's going to see those. Lily work. But God will. And that's how our relationship with God has to be. It's not for man. It's for me, it's for you and him. And that's it. So one way you can do that, and one way we do this as a family at Mount Movers Church is to do the 15-minute challenge. And so what the 15-minute challenge is, is five minutes of worship, five minutes of reading in your word, and five minutes of prayer. Now, if you've never taken this challenge, you've never done it, I promise you it will be a challenge. It, will, it could be hard. But just like Pastor Brad said in the last sermons, God sees your persistence. And you keep doing it, and that 15 minutes will turn into an hour. And that hour will turn into wanting more and more and more. Because I promise you, he's worth it all. He's worth your time. He's worth wasting everything you have on him. And his love is waiting on you. He wants you to know him. Some of you might be thinking, I don't know where to start really. I don't know if I can do the 15 minutes. I've wasted too much time. I'm too old. You don't know what's going on in my life right now. 
you don't know what I've done. I don't. I don't know your story, but I know mine. And I know what the devil sounds like. And he said the same thing to me. And I'm here to tell you, if he came after me, he's coming after you today. Uh, last year, me and my husband went to the Tipping Point Conference in Great Biden, Texas with the church. And Tony Evans was there and he was talking about judgment and one of the things that will happen on judgment. And he said, your works will be tested when you get to heaven. The good and the bad, all of it will be tested and will be put into fire. And then whatever's left, God will see. He said that my heart dropped. Lord, I've done some bad things. A lot of it, I wasted so much time getting back to you. There won't be enough. And in that, it's like Tony Evans could hear my thoughts. And in the next sentence, he said, but our God is a redeemer. He said, it's like this, when you go on vacation and you're driving and it maybe take it five hours to get there and it takes like, it's, it takes forever to get there. It feels like it takes forever to get there. But when you turn around and you go back home, it's like you're home. It's quick. He said, that's just, that's exactly how it is with Jesus. When you turn around and you start going the other direction, God will redeem your time. God will redeem your sins. And he will, you will go back to the place of how he created you. You will be used by God. I'm here to tell you today that you are not lost. There is still hope and his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word and your presence. Lord, there is freedom in knowing you, who you really are, knowing your love, your wisdom and power. Lord, we know you're going to use us, but God, most of all, above everything, we want to be known by you, that you recognize us on the day of judgment and that we hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And if you wanna hear those sweet words, if you really wanna know who Christ is today, you have the opportunity to make the best decisions you've ever made. You can ask Jesus right now into your heart and make him Lord of your life. If that's you today, with your eyes closed and your head bowed, can you raise your hand so I know who to be praying for? If you wanna accept Jesus in your life right now, I see you on the right, thank you. Both of you, thank you. I see you in the back on the bleachers, thank you. Some of you might be saying, I've already given my life to Jesus, but I wanna take that challenge. I wanna take that 15 minute challenge and I wanna pursue him with everything I have. That will be difficult and I wanna pray over you today for that as well. So if that's you, can you raise your hand? Thank you, I see you. I see all of you, praise Jesus. Well, here at Mount Movers, we pray, pray to, we pray together as a family. So let's pray. Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe you sent your son to die for my sins and he rose from the dead. Lord, come into my life. Renew me. Redeem me. Save me. I wanna know who you really are. Be the Lord of my life. In Jesus' precious name, amen.